So we're going to read a little bit more from Schelling's Ages of the World. Um, I didn't mention in the last video that it, it's a translation by Jason Wirth, who I think teaches at Seattle University. <clears throat> so this is from um, further on in the text, page 64 of this copy. <clears throat> and Schelling writes, it is not difficult to observe that the main weakness of all modern philosophy lies in the lack of an intermediate concept, and hence such that, for instance, everything that does not have being is nothing, and everything that is not spiritual in the highest sense is material in the crudest sense, and everything that is not morally free is mechanical, and everything that is not intelligent is uncomprehending. But the intermediate concepts are precisely the most important concepts, nay, the only concepts that actually explain anything in all of science. Hence, whoever wants to think in accordance with the misunderstood principle of contradiction may well be adroit enough, like the sophists, to dispute for and against everything. Yet they are utter, utterly mal maladroit, in finding the truth that does not lie in flagrant extremes. So in, in other words, it's the in-between, it's the way things participate with one another and exist in communion um, that is truly important uh, and because it, it is actually capable of giving a, a, an account of, of, of what's happening, um, of what there is and what we are. You know, these, these dualisms um, and extremes must become polarities, um, generative one of the other, rather than irreconcilably opposed. Um, so, Schelling goes on. But just as nature draws the being of the spiritual world to itself, and thereby withdraws it from its higher being, nature also awakens within the spiritual world a longing to become one with its higher being, and to draw it to the spiritual world. <clears throat> By virtue of this, that movement that emerges from nature finally propagates itself in the highest. After the prior explanations, it hardly demands any proof that the same creative forces that lie in nature are in the being of the spiritual world. There is also an inner duality in the being of the spiritual world in which, precisely on account of it, a concealed unity lies also at its base. This unity must become manifest by emerging to the measure as the measure in which the contrarily striving forces separate from each other and enter into an active antithesis. The yearning to draw the higher to itself becomes, in the being of the spiritual world, the ground of the unfolding and expansion of forces. Yet it is not the affirming principle that is contracted and concealed within it, but rather it is the negating force. Hence, here it is not the, not the discharging and self-communicating being that is delivered from delimitation. Here it is the opposite. It is that concealed force of darkness that is called forth from the innermost depths and posited piecemeal into act. It is not that this force transcends the affirming principle, but rather that the most active force of selfhood and that of darkness are nonetheless enveloped by light and love. For just as the negating principle is always the external and encompassing principle in the highest unfolding of external nature, while the spiritual principle, even when liberated for the highest, remains encompassed by the negating principle. So, too, the negating principle is roused from its inactivity in the unfolding of the spiritual world, which is only a higher nature, but only in order to remain as something active that is still within and obsequious to the gentle being of light. 
All creation moves toward the elevation of the yes over the no. But just as the negating principle is subjected to the affirming principle in nature, such that the negating principle is an external principle in the spiritual world, the negating principle remains an inner principle. Here the affirming principle is also intensified, but because it is already free in itself, it is only indirectly or intermediately intensified, in that its antithesis is called forth. The difference is of the most important consequence for the entire history of nature and of the spiritual world. Many a thing that is enigmatic in its relationship and its diversity only becomes clear by virtue of the fact that the former emerged into being through the elevation of light, and the latter emerged into being through the arousal of darkness. It is already manifest here that a higher degree of freedom is demanded in the being of the last kind than in the being of the first kind. I don't think I'm going to go on reading. Uh, I think trying to understand what Schelling just said in those last two paragraphs is probably difficult enough. Um, I was trying to show how spirit and, uh, and matter are sort of um, dependently colorizing and that sort of like the um, the Tao, um, which can be symbolized by a, a yin, yang, um, or the white half of the spiral has a black dot, and the black half of the spiral has a white dot. Um, he wants to, to see uh, the physical side of God, and the divine side uh, of matter, uh, the divine side of nature. And, you know, in order to do so, he has to take his own saying so uh, into, into account and to root his own ability to know the relationship between light and dark, um, between the yes and the no. He has to, you know, in, in some sense, give an account of his own being, and he tries to do so through a work of art, uh, rather than um, a sort of textbook or um, system of logic. So um, I guess that's that's enough showing for for one evening.